Okay, so first I think hematology in general practice I was asked to talk for 20 minutes. I know it's quite a very broad uh, topic. Um, so hematology actually, uh, I'll divide it into three areas. One is the benign hematology where you have the problems which come with the red cells, the platelets, the white cells, and then the transfusion related inquiries as well which you might have because of the blood diseases. And then the coagulation problems, that is the bleeding and hemostasis. Then you could have uh, something like the uh, problem with the bone marrow, such as the aplastic anemia, the myodysplasia, or the myofibrosis. And the second would be the uh, malignant hematology, whereas you have the blood cancers, the myelomas, and the lymphomas, and then the bone marrow transplants. And the procedures, what we do is the bone marrow biopsy, the chemotherapy, the uh, ABG as well. Um, so first I thought uh, it's going to be impossible to cover everything in the 20 minutes. So I thought, uh, even though the presentation runs through uh, quite a lot, I'll uh, do four main topics. One would be the anemia, and the other would be uh, uh, a little bit on malignant hematology, which would be the leukemia and the myelomas. Then I would uh, do a little bit in the end, the time permits about the blood coagulation and what you do when someone presents with the bleeding and things like that. And uh, if there is time, then I'll do extra things, but then I'll try and restrict to 20 minutes. So first, going through the uh, Anemia. So anemia is quite a common thing where you have uh, uh, reduced red cells uh, classically. So you can actually divide the anemia, I think, into depending on the size of the cells where you have a microcytic anemia when commonly it's due to the nutritional iron deficiency or it could be due to blood loss. Or you could have uh, macrocytic when the red cells are bigger. Then it could be due to deficiency of vitamins such as uh, B12 or folate, or it could be excess of alcohol consumption, or it could be a, a bone marrow problem like myelodysplasia when there is uh, ineffective erythropoiesis in the red cells. Then again, you could have something where the size is not big or small. It is somewhere in between. You have many patients who have diabetes, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. They, if you check the iron, it's low, the B12 is low. So that means it's probably anemia which is related to chronic disease. So that is uh, basically because the bone marrow, uh, what happens is there's excess of inflammation, there's a lot of cytokine production. So that suppresses the voices and also the iron delivery into the cells. So that's why when you get the anemia of chronic disease. Now it's important to find out which one it is because if you have iron deficiency, uh, you have to look for what is the cause. Say if you have an elderly gentleman, it could be, there could be some amount of uh, Reading going on from the gastrointestinal system, or it could be uh, it could be something sinister like uh, cancer of the bronchus or cancer of the gastrointestinal system, which also could be there in an elderly gentleman, which could present as a deficiency. But again, you have the common ones, whereas you have the uh, women in the reproductive age group, where when they have excessive periods, they can present as uh, high deficiency as well. And again, in uh, Vegetarians, you can have a lot of B12 or folate deficiency as well. So this is broadly the nutritional one. Then again, you can divide the anemia into hemolytic anemia, so where there is uh, red cell destruction. And when you have the red cell destruction, it could be directed by an antibody which is coating the red cells. It could be that the antibody is uh, IgG, which is the immunoglobin which acts at a warm temperature, or it could be the cold antibody, which is the IgM, which acts at the uh, Temperature. In the form you have classically what we call as autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Most of the cases of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, there is no cause, but sometimes they have secondary causes like after an infection or after a lymphoproliferative condition or after any other autoimmune diseases such as SLU or lymphoma, you could develop uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Again, in cold, you have like viral infections like mycoplasma or pneumonia, which could trigger off the blood cells to break. It's important to know the cold antibodies because if you're going to give blood to these kind of patients, you have to give the blood through a blood warmer. Otherwise, these cells can like So that's important to know if you have someone with hemolytic anemia, whether it's warm or cold. Because in cold, I think we need to have that. Then again, if you take the uh, non-immune, that is, there's no antibody-mediated destruction, you can look at the cells. I think if you take the red cell, it's a very biconcave cell. You have the cell membrane, then you have the cytoplasm, then you have the mitochondria. So I think you could, if you see the cell, red cell, it's actually a biconcave. The cell actually could be actually uh, changed in shape. So it could become spherical or elliptical, such as in hereditary spherocytosis or elliptosis. 
cytosis. And then that can cause anemia, erythrocytosis, splenomegaly, jaundice, and that could lead to uh, one of the uh, non immune hemolytic anemia. Then again, you have common enzyme G6PD deficiency, which is a glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase. When, if you have a low enzyme, then classically, if you are exposed to certain dietary things or certain medicines which contain sulfur containing compounds or even like infection, what happens is that you can have excessive oxidative hemolysis. When you hemolyze, the blood cells go down and they break, and this happens in the intravascular compartment. So what happens is that you have anemia, you have jaundice, you have hemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria, you have a dark urine as well. So I think uh, that is G6PD deficiency. Then again, you must have heard about thalassemia, sickle cell, where if you take the hemoglobin molecule, it's divided into heme and globin, heme uh, and globin, and in that you have the alpha and the beta uh, globin chains as well. Alpha has four chains and beta has two chains. If there is a change in the size, uh, in the shape of the beta chains, then you could have thalassemia or you could have sickle cell. This again will lead to ineffective anthropoiesis, whereby you have destruction of the cells and then that, that could lead to anemia and jaundice. Again, in sickle cell, the shape of the cell is uh, changed and you have like both shaped sickle cells. Again, in sickle cell, it's important because anyone going for a surgery or anything, before you give anesthesia, it's important to know it's sickle cell because otherwise you could have sickling crisis. In sickling crisis, what happens is that when you're exposed to anesthesia or low oxygen, the patient starts to break the cells, they can go and obstruct and can cause anemia and jaundice. Again, sickle cell patients are prone to having other problems as well. Say, for example, they could have a CDA, like a, a young patient presenting with a stroke, or they could have someone with a chest crisis, or in the males, they can have priapism priapism where they have erectile uh, problems which goes on for a long time. So these are the common things which can happen in uh, anemia which is due to non-immune hemolytic. So broadly, as you can see, anemia is a very vast uh, topic and uh, it's important to know whether it's nutritional or whether it's uh, due to a particular disease or whether you're dealing with something like a hemolytic anemia. If you're dealing with a hemolytic anemia, the age of the patient is going to be important, the family history, the personal history, the past history would be uh, important to identify which one it is. Now, uh, this is uh, another blood film actually, as you can see. This is uh, from the patient who has iron deficiency anemia. As you can, uh, so as you can see, the cells are all uh, very pale. They are very small in uh, size, so we call this as uh, microcytic hypochromic and then uh, I'm trying to get this pointer, which one is the pointer? So in this you have target cells as well where there is a central pattern and when there is a small dot in it. So hypochromia microcytosis target cells is classical of the iron deficiency anemia. So when you have this, I think the most important thing what you do is whether you're bleeding is one of the important things. It could be either the menstrual loss or it could be one from the uh, uh, gastrointestinal system as well. The test which would help you would be the iron studies uh, like the iron ferritin or the uh, transfer and saturation. Again, a bone marrow also would reveal absence of iron as well. It's not necessary to do a bone marrow on everyone who presents with iron deficiency, but I think. If someone has got iron deficiency, they're not responding to iron therapy, and they're very elderly, you've ruled out other causes, and I think it would be wiser to do because, I, again, I've seen patients who have presented with a bone marrow problem, and we have found out in the last, uh, when we've done the test. Again, uh, the important thing in the iron deficiency anemia is, we all know we could give iron when someone presents with iron deficiency, it could be given orally, or it could be given parentally, now you have the FCM preparations as well, where you could give the whole body uh, iron uh, based on the body weight, and it's quite easy to give as well. You could have one dose injection or two dose injection, depending on it. And usually you would respond either to the oral or to the IV iron. But the important thing is when you have a patient who don't respond to oral iron, I think it's important to know whether the patient is bleeding or whether they are uh, have other deficiencies like B12 or folate, or whether they are malabsorbing or whether because. If they are malabsorbing, whatever iron you give orally is not going to get into the system. And again, uh, 
it's important to consider parenteral iron in certain situations because you want the hemoglobin up very quickly because oral iron is going to take a long time. Parenteral iron will replenish within a couple of weeks. So I think especially in pregnancy and things where you want a higher uh, iron content very quickly, then I think IV iron would be the uh, treatment of choice. Uh, but again, uh, there are many FCMs and things which we can't use in pregnancy as well. So that we have to bear in mind. Again, in B12, I think, uh, as I said before, it happens in vegans, but again, the pernicious anemia is one type of anemia where you have an antibody which is uh, directed to uh, uh, the intrinsic factor which is present in the uh, proximal uh, uh, part of the duodenum as well as in the stomach. And uh, if you have an antibody mediated destruction there, you could have. Uh, B12 deficiency, and again, as you go into the small bowel, like the IVM and the blood group, uh, you can still get uh, B12 deficiency. Then moving on to uh, uh, the investigations, have, I think the one thing to point out here is you can see the neutrophils have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How much should be around five lobes? You know, here you have more than five lobes. That is uh, neutrophil hypersegmentation, and again, you can see these cells are all oval macrocytes and they have got poikilocytes as well. So I think this is characteristic of someone who has got a megaloblastic anemia. So if you do have someone with megaloblastic anemia, the bone marrow also confirms the same. And again, you could do a Schilling's test where you could see how the B12 is absorbed by the intrinsic factor and through the transcovalent and see whether that is uh, deficient or not. Again, moving on to folate uh, deficiency. Again, folate is something where you have because of pure nutrition, elderly people, someone exposed to ethanol, and again, drugs, most of them which uh, use the uh, uh, hepatic uh, cytochrome B450, that is the phenytoin carbohydrates, OCTs, and things can all cause folate consumption. Again, the methoprexate and things like that, the anti uh, uh, folate drugs can cause, and again, someone who's having uh, uh, sulfur containing drugs for UTI can also develop acute folate deficiency, causing a uh, bone marrow suppression, that's something to bear in mind as well. Again, anemia of chronic disease, the most important thing is the three things what we come across is someone with joint uh, problems, renal problems or with thyroid problems, the endocrine ones. Again, in renal, it's uh, classically because of low erythropoietin. And I think we usually give erythropoietin and IV ions to improve the blood cells. And I mean, the same approach goes for someone with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis as well. This is because it's a cytokine mediated uh, suppression of the red cells. So I think if you do a bone marrow, you could see uh, the iron uptake is reduced. So you have to give both the iron and erythropoietin in uh, stimulating the bone marrow for these patients. And usually IV iron has to be given for these patients. Again, you can do an erythropoietin level. And I think if you have a low or a normal erythropoietin, that will predict the response as well. Um, then moving on from the anemia of chronic disease. So what happens? You have someone with anemia, you have given iron, you have given B12, you have given folate, or you have given uh, done the uh, other things. The patient is not responding. Then I think you have a bone marrow problem. It could be because of uh, myelodysplasia. What happens in myelodysplasia is there's ineffective erythropoiesis. The red cells are being produced and they're being destroyed. It not only happens in the red cell series, it can also happen in the white cell or the platelets. So if you have someone who has got anemia who's not responding to your standard iron therapy, then this could be something like a bone marrow problem. Basically, what we call is aging of the bone marrow, where the stem cells get aged. And it can also happen in younger individuals, but they don't <coughs> produce the red cells, the white cells, and platelets. So you could have either single lineage uh, cytopenia, or you could have multi-lineage cytopenia. There is anemia, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia. Again, there's an increased risk of uh, developing an acute uh, leukemia as well in these individuals. Again, if you treat them with uh, some particular drugs like hypomethylating agents, erythropoid and growth factors, they can usually reverse the bone marrow state as well. Again, we have a broader classification of dividing them into low, higher risk, and medium risk. I won't go through it, but I think the important thing is if you don't respond uh, to iron, B12, and folate, it's something to think about. You could do a bone marrow and confirm the diagnosis. Now, going, on, going into the leukemia presentation, as you can uh, see, uh, in leukemia what happens is there is a high white count or a low white count. Suddenly the patient... Uh, 10 minutes. 15 minutes. 5 minutes. 5 minutes. 
So again, in, in leukemia, what you have is you can either have a high white count, which produces either uh, uh, problems such as uh, hypoviscosity, such as you have leukostasis, you have uh, uh, suddenly the patient uh, having slow mentation, suddenly the patient is confused, or the patient presents with thrombocytopenia, or the patient is bleeding, or the patient has anemia. So suddenly, if you do a, take a blood count, you can see the hemoglobin is 3 grams, the white count is 100, or the platelet count is around 10,000. And the patient must have had a normal count previously, so they would be either tired, weak, lethargic, they would have had an infection, they would have bled. I think things would go fast. You know? So these are the symptoms which you should be aware of someone presenting with leukemia. So what we do is, we, these kind of patients can die quickly, so we say they have to be admitted, we have to treat the infection, and we have to give them fluids, and then we have to correct the coagulopathy, and then the proper planning has to be done for the leukemia in terms of the control of the white cell count and the finding the type of leukemia and the chemotherapy is what we have to institute. So again, you could classify the acute myoid and acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Acute leukemia is the one where they come on very quickly. They have symptoms of uh, low platelet count bleeding, whereas the chronic leukemia is the ones where you have CLL, chronic lymphocytic or chronic myeloid, they have big spleen, lymph nodes, they have these symptoms, that is fever, weight loss, night sweats, and uh, they go over a period of time. So chronic you have time, whereas in acute you need to act uh, quickly. Now moving from the leukemia, uh, because of the time, uh, I'll just, uh, this is one of the patients who presented with these uh, blasts, where you can say they look like mature cells. Now again, I move on to multiple myeloma, which is again a bone marrow cancer, where there is malignancy of the bone marrow, where there's excessive plasma cells which are produced, which can cause anemia, bone pain, pathological fractures, lytic lesions, and renal failure. You must have all heard of the CRAP symptoms, which is hypercalcemia, renal failure, anemia, bone pain. So this characteristically, you have an uh, M protein which is produced, which causes disruption of the bone marrow, causes the lytic lesions as you can uh, see here in the humerus. And if you look at the bone marrow, you can see these cells. They have uh, nice uh, dots here, which are the immunoglobulin producing plasma cells. The nucleus is very centrically placed. And the cytoplasm is very basically. So these are the plasma cells. So anyone who presents with anemia, renal impairment, joint pain, uh, bone pain, hypercalcemia, looking at the albumin globulin ratio, it's reversed. You do have protein electrophoresis, you have an M protein. I think this is something to bear in mind as well. Again, when you do a bone marrow, you could identify it is uh, multiple myeloma. And again, you have uh, lots of new treatments ranging from immunomodulating drugs uh, to uh, proteasome inhibitors to monoclonal antibodies, which could uh, actually alter the course of the condition. I think the current median survival when I put this slide was 10, 15 years back was five years, but now I can say it's probably 15 to 20 years with the advent of uh, uh, new drugs by the uh, new drugs which have been approved by the FDA. Now, uh, I will just move on to the last bit. Sorry, there's a lot of slides. I go into the variation, you know. I think uh, this is something where I'll just finish off. Uh, normally, when you have an injury, there's a primary hemostasis and a secondary hemostasis. What happens in primary hemostasis, your platelets will not stick to that particular area. So you have a platelet endothelium that sticks to the GP1B axis and then the GP2B3A will act, whereas the platelet adhesion happens, and the platelet aggregation happens. So that is a primary hemostatic block. And from that, what you have is your clotting cascade which activates. You have three cascades which get activated. On the left-hand side, you can have the cellular injury, which is your extrinsic factor, which is your 2, 7, 9, and 10. And then the intrinsic factor, which have the 8, 9, 11, and 12. So they both get activated. Then there is a common pathway, where your factor thrombin gets converted to fibrinogen and fibrinogen to fibrin, that is how your blood clot forms. So what I just wanted to go through here is your growth. Normally when you check someone's blood coagulation, you would check prothrombin time, activate a partial thromoblast in time, and a platelet count. So your prothrombin time actually would measure your uh, uh, left side, which is your extrinsic pathway. Whereas the intrinsic pathway is your APG gene, okay? And then your common pathway up to your fibrin is what is being measured in your fibrinogen. 
But what happens after the fibrin is formed is your fibrinolysis happens. Whereas you have your plasminogen activator gets converted to your plasmin, then the fibrinogen gets converted. So this pathway we are not checking actually. So this is something to bear in mind. So there's only one, two things what I wanted to say. So in the history of someone who presents with bleeding, the first important thing is you take a history saying whether there's an obstetric history of bleeding or whether there's a dental history of bleeding, whether there's a drug history. When you know the history is very good, the patient has not bled, and if you've done a CBC, PTA, DDT, then it's perfect. <coughs> you don't need to do any other testing. But supposing if your baseline tests, uh, if they have a strong history and your baseline tests are uh, also normal, then it would still be a problem in the clotting. Because as, as I've shown you uh, before, it could be either the bond very branch, the platelet function which is sticking together, which is not, or the rare coagulation factors like factor 13 which is missed. And again, any other problems such as fibrinolysis and things are missed. So someone who presents with a strong history, then I think you do have to uh, uh, think about these things. And yeah. that I think because of time, I'll yeah. yeah, I think we'll skip the questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I request uh, the picture to come and do this?